Great hello and, and welcome everybody. I hope people in the room can hear me okay and hopefully people online can also hear me okay. If there's a problem, somebody just wave at me, otherwise I shall crack on. Uh, good evening and a very warm welcome to you all. My name is uh, Professor Francis Bowen and I'm Pro Vice Chancellor for the Social Sciences Faculty here at UEA. And thank you for joining us for UEA's fifth inaugural lecture of the autumn season. It's actually our second one in the faculty, and it's actually our second economist, but he's from the School of Development, International Development. And it's really great to be here this evening in person with those of you here on a rather cold and dark evening. And of course, uh, welcome also to those of you joining us online uh, on YouTube. So thank you for taking part. Please do let us know where you are in the world, where you're watching from, uh, if you're online. And I'd, of course, like to welcome our speaker for this evening, Professor Corrado Di Maria. More on him in a moment. And also we have with us today the head of the School of Economics, Professor Emilia Lazarova, who will give the vote of thanks. And it's not in the script, but I'd also like to point out that two kids are here too. Uh, <laughs> it's great. Welcome to you all, to the whole family. So a few words about our speaker. Uh, Corrado de Maria is a professor in environmental and natural resource economics. He studied in Rome, Milan, and Vienna be before obtaining his PhD from Tilburg University in the Netherlands. Prior to joining the University of East Anglia, he worked at the University of Birmingham, Queen's University Belfast, and UCD, University College Dublin. Corrado is an economist whose broad research interests span environmental and natural resource economics, energy economics, the economics of growth and technological change, as well of, as development economics. And it says on his webpage that he'll supervise almost any topic in those areas, so a broad range of interests. And the focus of Corrado's research is on how technology may alleviate resource scarcity and pollution problems and contribute to sustainable development and how environmental policies may be designed to guide the process of technical change towards a more sustainable future. Corrado started his academic career as a theorist before branching into more empirical work. In his research, he now combines both theory and empirics to address policy relevant questions and inform policy debates. And in fine UEA fashion, his recent work focuses on the impact of climate policy on firms' behavior and performance, on the use of natural resources and biodiversity in particular to underpin a sustainable bioeconomy and on using productivity analysis to evaluate ecosystem services. I have the great pleasure of working with Corrado as he's the Associate Dean for, so, for uh, Postgraduate Research uh, at the Social Sciences Faculty here with us in UEA. And it's wonderful for me to observe how he inspires, challenges, cajoles, cheerleads, and generally supports our postgraduate research community here. So thank you, Corrado, for everything you're doing for our PhD students, not just in economics, but right across the social sciences. So it really does give me great pleasure in welcoming Corrado now to give his inaugural lecture. The floor is yours. I'm very much looking forward to learning more tonight. Thank you, Corrado. Come on up. Thank you very much, Francis. Thank you very much for the kind words. I hope that you find the talk inspiring and interesting. Um, I would like to start by thanking the, per the people who are the reasons why I'm here today. So thanks to my family. I would like to um, thank my family from Rome and say thank you, grazie. They said that they would try to log in. Let's see if they managed. And um, just before I start, I would like to Share a thought about my father who's recently passed away. And um, sorry, <laughs> I knew I shouldn't do this. Okay. Um, thanks are also due, obviously, to the university for organizing this and for the School of Economics for their support over the years. I have um, uh, a few things. I have 40 minutes to share with you uh, what I've learned about 
how uh, firms behave when uh, under uh, the pressures of climate policy. Um, and this is um, very surprising for me, even for me, that I have the second line there because as Francis pointed out, I started out as a, as a theorist and I never touched data until after my PhD. But then I found out that, especially in this area actually, it's very important for theorists to interrogate the data, to update their understanding of the world, to update their uh, policy recommendations, and make sure that what we say to policymakers makes sense and might work at scale especially. Um, let me start with uh, a personal recollection here. So when I was an undergraduate student back in the 90s in Rome, um, one of the first things that I remember going to one an extra event, an extracurricular event, was a talk on sustainability. And this deeply resonated with me, this idea that as human beings, as parents, as researchers, as uh, consumers, we really need to share um, uh, a responsibility for making sure that our behavior respects planetary boundaries. Back then, there was not as much talk as there is about climate change today, and things have moved on quite a lot. But I think that what I'm, since then I've been interested in this and I think that what I'm going to talk about today is very timely and it's very um, important. So I hope that you will learn a few things and that from your feedback, from the questions, from discussions afterwards, I will also learn what questions might be usefully uh, addressed. Right, so uh, since the 1990s, a lot, of, a lot of water has passed under the bridges, so much so that nowadays, I hope, if I do this, you understand immediately that I talk about climate change. What is this? These are warming stripes. This is a very clever way of telling us that the climate is getting warmer. So what we see here is a graphical representation of deviation from the mean temperature of, the of 1970 to 2000, if I remember correctly. And what you see is back from 1850, where the graph starts, up to 2020, we have blue lines on the left that represent colder periods, so negative deviations from that average. And then you get to the white area where you're close to the average, and then everything that happens most recently is red, very dark red at the end. So clearly, there is an understanding nowadays, an evolution in the thinking that um, global temperature changes are here and climate change is happening. It's an emergency, something that we need to address. But the most striking thing for me is, a, is another change that has happened, a change in the political climate, in the social climate. A few years ago in, in, the, in the 1990s when you were reading the IPCC report, uh, they had to be very careful in terms of attributing a uh, degree of confidence to their statements. And it was striking for me to notice that the first statement of the summary for policymakers in 2021 starts with, it is unequivocal that human influence has warmed the atmosphere, ocean, and land. So there is no way that what is happening is not our fault. And we have to take responsibility for this and change. And this change in the climate change and the change in climate is influencing also the way in which policy, policy is being shaped. But before we can uh, address policy, which is what I do for a living, if you wish, to understand how policy influences the behavior of firms and whether we, what kind of policy we have to design to make sure that we get to the target, let me start by um, uh, discussing a bit what we are up against. Okay, so this is not the most recent data, this is 2016 data, but I like the graph and I think it makes sense and it's, it gives a sense of the challenge that we have. And also explains why is it that I'm going to talk about manufacturing firms and industry. Um, this is about greenhouse gas emissions, it's not only CO2, so it's not only um, uh, combustion of fossil fuels, it's all a range of uh, things happening in the world. The majority of greenhouse gas emissions come from energy, 73%. A third of that comes from energy use in industry. Okay, that's the top corner there. And these are emissions associated with heat and power in manufacturing and production of goods for human consumption. There are other big important things that happen. There is 
energy use in buildings, there is transportation, private transportation, road transportation, cars, aviation. And there is another bit, and another reason why I like to focus on industry is the gray segment there that says industry 5.2%. These are processing uh, emissions. These are not connected with the use of fossil fuels, but with the, um, uh, with the chemical processes that are inherent in the production of cement, for example, or other chemicals, okay? So why is it that I look at um, industry? Because industry is big and there is another reason. And maybe the, the UK government can help us understand why. So what we see here, this is the, from the government strategy, 2021 net zero strategy to 2050. The, the government has this goal that the UK will be net, net zero, so carbon neutral by 2050. And what is happening here is you see this, I don't know what color this is, it's, it's not the most beautiful color they could choose, but this is industry. And as you see in 2020, industry is not the largest share in the UK, the UK is not an intensely industrial uh, uh, country anymore, but you see that it persistingly constant or there's a small f uh, decrease, but not much. So the second, and the same thing actually you find in the European Union uh, document, this is from 2000 to 2050, and uh, the pale blue area here is industry, and as you see, there is a bit of a decline until 2020, and then it's stubbornly persistent for a long period of time. So the reason why I like industry or I like working on industry is because it's big, so it makes sense, it's relevant, and it's hard. It's difficult to decarbonize industry, okay? And the third reason why I like working on industry is this. So this is from McKinsey, it's called an abatement curve. Uh, you bring a bunch of engineers in a room, they think and talk about what, how different ways to decarbonize the economy and they come up with either cost, how much it would cost to decarbonize or how, many, how much it could be saved in terms of decarbonizing the economy. So here on the left hand side, you have negative uh, carbon cost. So if you were able to, this is computed for 2050. So by 2050, the technology for electric vehicles uh, hydrogen fuel cell buses and so on and so forth will be so developed that actually sw switching from away from fossil fuels into uh, electric, renewable electric, uh, would be a negative cost. So it's a cost saving. The, the blue, the area on the left is mostly dark blue, blue and black, which is power, buildings and transportation. The area on the right where you have positive costs is pale blue which is industry. So even in 2050, it's gonna be very costly to decarbonize industry. So industry is big, it's hard, and the technology is not here. Three conditions that I think are very important to focus on the type of policy instruments that I uh, think are important to deploy in this context. What kind of policy instruments do we have at our disposal? Well, we've heard uh, here in the UK, um, a discussion recently of mandating um, uh, electric vehicles charging point for all new houses and new build, that's fine. It allows for electric cars to be much more broadly accessible. So this sorts um, a coordination failure or a bottleneck and allows for cost savings. That's a typical command and control policy. But such a policy would not do anything on the right hand side of this scale, of this, uh, of this graph, because if you can mandate the use of that technology when and if it becomes available, but this might mean sending all these banks, or this, this, sorry, this, uh, these firms bankrupt. So you don't want to wipe out a, an industrial sector, you want to make sure that they decarbonize. So what do you do in this case is ideally to give a strong signal that they need to economize these factors, this carbon in this case. So you, st you give them a strong price signal that carbon emissions are a costly input in, their in the production process and they need to start economizing. So in a way, you make sure that they start now to think of how to develop technology to bring those bars down, okay? And to deploy this technology. Or find different ways of doing the same product. Cement doesn't, at the moment, needs uh, or releases a lot of carbon dioxide. 
there might be different ways. There are already demonstration plants that do different technology that do not require calcination that uh, emits carbon dioxide. So these kind of technologies are bet or best ideally uh, achieved by pricing carbon. A carbon price is usually thought about as a tax, but taxes were, at least in the European Union, in 2001 a no starter. So we moved away from taxes and we ended up with um, the next best thing, if you wish, which is an emission trading scheme. And this is the type of instrument that has become the cornerstone of the European Union uh, climate policy, and namely the EU ETS, the European Union Emission Trading Scheme. And I've been working on this for the last 15 or so years. And as an economist, as a theorist, I can tell you that it's very simple. You need to set a cap. You need to uh, somehow, and actually as a theorist, I should tell you that the basic model tells me that it doesn't make any difference if you give it for free, if you give these permits away for free, grandfathering, or you auction the permit. They should not make a difference. Real cost and opportunity cost should have the same impact. And then you let firms trade these permits. And by trading, they should find the cheapest possible way of achieving this cap. So the cap cannot be uh, um, exceeded. Everybody's happy with trading, and we achieve the target at least cost. So again, as a theorist, I can tell you that this type of uh, programs have several important properties. One is the environmental integrity. The cap is fixed, it cannot be exceeded. Because if you exceed your emissions, you don't have enough uh, allowances to present um, uh, to the regulator, you will be fined. It's very flexible. And what I mean by flexible is that when there is a situation like today, where demand, well, not exactly today, but let's say yesterday, when we were expecting a great recovery in the global economy coming up soon, and there is a lot of demand for energy, and we expect a lot of emissions that need to be covered by uh, permits in the future, the price increases. And this is what happened in the last few days. This is uh, the carbon price viewer from Sandbag, and it goes from 2008, which is, as we will see, the beginning of trading uh, or the first phase of the UETS until 2021. As you see, the price goes up and down. When there is a lot of demand or expected demand, the prices go up. It's never been higher. It's over 70, 70 euros per ton. After the recession in 2000, uh, the, the financial crisis in 2009, the prices dropped dramatically because we were expecting the opposite, a long protracted um, uh, fluctuation or negative situation in, in demand, which does not require uh, to cover many emissions, so the prices go down. And given that in the UTS there, is no, there was no mechanism to um, drain liquidity, if you wish, from the system, the price stayed very low for many, many years, as low as three euros per ton. Anyway, it's flexible in the sense that when there is no need for, um, for carbon for, uh, for allowances, the price goes down, and this allows firms to uh, breathe, if you wish, in a period where they, they don't need to be pressed by uh, a tax that might require much more complicated political decisions to be lowered in a similar situation. And instead, it's very high when um, uh, the price goes up, when uh, demand is high. And it's also cost effective. As I said, firms trade these allowances, so if I am a high cost uh, firm, I, I cost in the sense that it costs me a lot of money to, um, uh, to abate, to do what I do usually to produce my chairs, my tables without carbon. Uh, I can decide to stop production or to buy permits. And if I find someone who has a very low abatement cost, so they can do their tiles or the carpets with very, very little carbon, they will be able to reduce their emissions and sell me their um, uh, the surplus permits. So I'm happy because I don't have to spend all that money to, um, uh, to produce my uh, table, and they're happy because not only they produce their own goods, but they also get some money for their saved emissions. So by doing this, I basically arbitrage out, as, if, as economists would tell you, 
the difference in, margin, in, in abatement costs. And at the end, I find the, pla the place where the all costs are equal, equalized, and which is the cheapest way of achieving a target. Again, this is the theory. And also the theory tells me that such uh, a scheme, such a, a policy instrument gives probably the highest incentives for um, uh, technological innovation. If I save and if I find a way to produce my, or if I invent a new way of producing my carpet at even cheaper uh, cost in terms of carbon, I can sell even more of these uh, surplus allowances in the market and I make money. So I will do the mo my utmost to get new technology going. So incentive for technical change are very strong. This is the theory. And now I will spend the rest, I don't know exactly how much time I have, the rest of the uh, 30 minutes that I have to go over the empirics. I will use the uh, UETS as a policy, um, as my case study, and I will focus on the last bit down here. There is, despite the, all these pro positive properties or good properties that the ETS has, there's a lot of pushback from businesses and this is focused on exposure to competition arguments. So it's, it, it makes it difficult to sell because I have costs that other firms don't have. I cannot sell my stuff. I'm going to stop making profits. I'm going to lay off workers. I'm going to go bankrupt. And this is the reason why industry is also, in the, is also interesting because it's big and it's a lot of lobbying power. So they, they tend to get their way. And I think that the, our role as social scientists is also to understand the details of these arguments and see who is right and who needs protection and who, needs, who, who doesn't need protection. This is some of the things that we are going to look at today. So over the last 15 years, I've done a few things. I'm going to go over some of these things, uh, probably not all of them, but let me start with the first question. Uh, I hope I have 30 minutes or thereabouts. Um, and the first question is whether the UETS has made a difference in terms of emissions. I use micro data here because I want to make sure that I compare a firm that is subject to the UETS because it's big with a firm that is not subject to the UETS but is big enough to be comparable. So there are thresholds, there are situations where a firm that is just large enough to be treated gets treated and, and firms that are just smaller than the threshold uh, don't get treated. And I'm looking for matches of these firms with each other. I'm using it, or I used back in 2008 when we did this research, data from Lithuania, uh, and we did exactly this. So we, we looked at all the treated firms in Lithuania and we looked for matches within the same sector firms that were similar enough but non-treated. And we did it by looking at one firm or several firms, combining them, doing matching, which is called kernel matching or nearest neighbor, many to one matching and so on and so forth. Different type of things, these are the results. The graph, the, the, forget, forgive me if, if it's not exactly clear, but if you don't see stars, there are no differences. The differences that we are looking at is whether a, a treated firm emits less or more or less than a non-treated firm, a comparable non-treated firm. And what we see here, let me get my mouse, it's here, CO2 emission kilotons. There is no statistically significant difference in the first three years of the treatment. Unfortunately, afterwards, Lithuania decided that collecting data and making them publicly available was not a good idea, so I cannot do 2009 and 10, but 2005, 6, and 7, there was no difference. And we know that Lithuania was particularly generous in terms of allocating allowances to, to, to firms. So giving them allowances for free, while theoretically might be the same thing as letting them buy the, the, the permits at an auction, doesn't seem to have had exactly the same effect mostly because since many other European countries did the same, they didn't have anybody to trade with, okay? Okay, so this is um, Lithuania 2005-2007. These results incidentally are, or chime at least with some results that are more recent. As you see here, in the first phase, there was no effect. 
This shows that there is a difference afterwards. I haven't, this is not based on microdata. I haven't seen microdata that actually confirm this. The microdata that I've seen that confirm that there is a negative result are the ones from France, but they also show that the same firm has reduced emission in this plant that is treated by the UETS and has increased it in the next door plant that is not treated by the UETS. So emissions have not decreased dramatically. Or if they have decreased, they have decreased independently of the ETS. Um, the second thing firms were asking us, and I was at UCD at this time, Irish firm were complaining that it was too costly to do this. And especially my boss uh, at UCD was really incensed because the, the, the little boiler at the UCD had to be part of the full scheme. Okay, so they had to spend a lot of money in terms of gearing up to do this. And so what we did, we went out, we collect, we interviewed all the 78 firms representing 119 installations, if I remember, about their costs, the costs they were incurring in terms of uh, gearing up, hiring people, learning how to use the monitoring devices, the software, and so on and so forth. And we split this cost into early implementation costs, so the training, the purchasing of the kit, the, the, the sensors, and monitor and, re and um, uh, monitoring, uh, uh, reporting and verification costs. So the, the administrative costs actually are ongoing. Every year you have to do the same thing. And we split this sample, well, first we, we summed up everything, so there is a large sum of money, half a million uh, euro, uh, spent by large companies and a bit less by medium and small enterprises. But that not, that's not particularly important statistic. What we were interested in is or was whether there was a level playing field that was preserved by the ETS. And, it, and there wasn't. So large enterprises were actually spending five euro cents per ton to do all this. And instead, small enterprises were spending upwards of two, of two euros. And two euros at the time was almost 20% of the allowance prices. So obviously that was not the case. My boss was vindicated and the small uh, installations were removed from the list. So they could uh, voluntarily participate, but they didn't need to do all this. They have a simplified process, okay? So as you see, if you do your analysis and you check uh, that the transaction cost are actually, argument is actually probably relevant, it is relevant for the small enterprises, so let's remove them. You can help policymakers be do better decisions. What else do we want to know? Um, the third part of the argument is that firms always put forward is that this ETS treatment will make them have lower profits. And we did this in Lithuania. You have seen the, the graph uh, and there was a tiny little, what is it? Somewhere down here, there is a, a very small drop in, in, in profitability in 2007. Um, I wouldn't put too much emphasis on that, so because I didn't trust so much the, the quality of the data on that particular point. Uh, and so we, we decided to do the same thing for Germany. So we moved, we changed data set, uh, we applied for, to ac for access to the AFID data, which is the Amtliche Firmendaten für Deutschland, and the interesting thing is the amplitude. So there's a, the fact that this is administrative data. So firms don't have a choice whether to answer or not. They have to answer this questionnaire. So you have information on thousands of German firms in manufacturing, and you know a lot about these firms. Great data set. One thing they don't have is profits, but they have all the costs and all the revenue. So you do revenue minus cost, take away taxes, blah, blah, blah. You get your definition of profits. We did this and there's not much analysis, it's a sum or a subtraction. Uh, and what we did, we did exactly the same thing as we did for Lithuania, but now we can do it with many more, more with much more disaggregation because we have data that we can um, uh, differentiate across sectors. So the little numbers that you have up there are the, the two digit IC codes for these industries and uh, for example, 10 is food products, 17 is paper and paper products, 24 is my favorite basic metals, and it's my favorite because for once uh, I could share, I could show industry that actually they are making more money than their counterparts that are not treated. So 
and that's three stars, which for an economist is a good thing, right? So it means that if I were to randomly create, generate or draw these numbers only once in 100 tries, I would get that result by pure chance. So I have 99% confidence that that is, three, uh, that is a significant difference. So they have made more profits in um, the average firm in basic metal in Germany between 2005 and 2014 has made more profits than the untreated counterparts. Okay, so this is the kind of thing that you can uh, inf provide to the policymakers, and th there is nothing else that is significant here. So there is no negative impact, if anything, a positive one. Oops, what did I do? Uh, okay. Right, so the third thing, or the, well, the third, fourth, fifth thing that firms uh, uh, complain about is that they don't have enough, there's no enough variation to, to trade in the market. It's difficult for them to trade uh, within industry. Uh, the, the, the ETS, the whole idea that is predicated on high cost firms trading with the small cost or low cost firms just doesn't work because they are all doing the same thing and they, they cannot trade, they cannot improve so much. If this were the case, this data would not tell this story. So this is all of German manufacturing between 2003 and 2014. And this is a way that we found to uh, measure the trade-off between, so the, how much output, the value of outputs so or revenue, they are going to have to technically, technically, well, that they're going to have to give up to reduce one more unit of carbon emissions. This is called the shadow price. Technically is the, is the slope of the transformation function. We don't want to get there, but that number means that there are quite a few firms. So how do you read the, the box plots is the little whisker at the bottom here represents, if you imagine the distribution of shadow prices across uh, German firms, that little point there is the firm that is as the, is the first decile. So only 10% of the firms have lower costs. So that's the 10th decile. If you move up, the, the bottom of the box is a quartile. So 25% of the firms have costs below that. Then the bar in the middle of the, not in the middle, but in the, in the box is the median. So 50% of the firms have cost below that. 75% of the firms have cost below this level here. And 90% of the firms have cost below this one. So this tells us that even dropping the very extreme cases, the bottom 10% and the top 10%, we have a range in German manufacturing of firms that are able to abate further uh, carbon at a cost that range from close to zero, this is around one or two euros per ton, to all the way up to up there, it's over 200 euros. So that means that there are massive opportunities for trading. And those firms up, the, up there, they can stay in business because they have these firms here to trade with, the lower ones. Okay, so this is, um, this is the piece of information that we find from this research. What we don't find is a convergence in this that you would expect if there was a lot of trading. So apparently there is not much trading, probably because the ETS is not stringent enough, but it's not the problem of the ETS, it's the problem of the, the policymakers responding to calls from industry not to reduce the cap sufficiently to push them, to squeeze them to a common uh, shadow price. So this is what we find in this research. Finally, no, well not finally, but almost finally, the, the thing that I like the most is um, this argument that says that, you know, I am a German manufacturer and I am very successful, I produce amazing goods, but you slap on me this tax or this price of carbon and I cannot, there's no way I can compete with um, Chinese firms or American firms or Brazilian firms that don't have carbon pricing. So I'm going to go bust, right. This is the, and what happens at this stage is that the European Commission 
believes these firms or is open to their concerns and they introduce a list of firms that do not have to buy to purchase their uh, allowances. So they are grandfathered, they allow, they're given a valuable asset for free um, because otherwise they would go bankrupt. So if this is the case, what I should see is the following. If it's true that um, the ETS makes this firm less competitive by increasing their costs, I should see that they are not able to pass on this cost on to consumers, so to sell their own products at a higher price. So this should mean that the difference between the margin between the cost and the price should shrink over time and, and only for uh, the, um, uh, the ETS firms. So in technical terms, the markup of these firms should shrink, should be compressed by uh, competitive pressures. What we find in the, in the first 10 years of the UETS is that the markup for German firms is around between 30 in this uh, iteration is between 30 and 50%. So whenever there is a, a price shock, a cost shock, they are able to pass on 50% of this onto consumers. This is all the firms. The important bit here is that the interaction between the marginal cost and the indicator for ETS is not significant. So there is no difference between what the German, friend, the German firms outside of the ETS do compared to what German firms inside the ETS do. So there is no value whatsoever to this argument. This is for all the manufacturing sector. I have this amazing data set that allows me to do the same thing for almost every sector in German manufacturing. This result goes through everywhere. These marginal, these um, markups are constant and allow for the passing on of at least 30% of the, of the cost. Actually, these firms on average in the ETS in Germany, they get at least 80% of their allocation for free. So they're making money again from this. Okay, so this is something that hopefully the European Commission is going to find interesting now, especially now that they are debating again whether to have continued grandfathering or border adjustments to protect uh, industries. Maybe you don't need either, but who knows. We haven't done an analysis of leakage, so we, we don't know about that yet. And finally, uh, as Francis was mentioning, I was always very interested in innovation. And before uh, wrapping up, I want to tell you something about how innovation is measured by economists. Usually innovation is measured as either money that firms spend on R&D or on patents that come out at the other end of the process as, pro as product products of the innovation or the invention process. So this is, these are two proxies, two, two possible way of measuring this, but it doesn't really um, capture much of what happens in firms. Because firms innovate or improve by changing processes, changing manager, changes the way people look at things, talk about things, do things every day. So one way of measuring this is by looking at methods of productivity analysis. So what I mean is that if you think about firms being mixing different inputs to go and produce some output, you're thinking about something, some function that maps from outputs into inputs. And some firms are very good at doing that. Some firms are less good at doing that. So if you can map the, the front runners, the most efficient or effective uh, firms, you can construct a frontier. The best way of that in that sector, in that year, uh, firms have found to uh, produce efficiently. And then you can have this distance function, as it's called, the, the curve thing, equal to one. So these are the firms that are the front runner, the best in, in the class, okay? And then you can, you look at every other firm, like A here, and you can measure this distance in many different ways. We chose to do it in what is called an hyperbolic way, but basically you try to find a way to measure the distance from this firm to the front runners, okay? And this is called um, a distance to frontier or uh, a technical efficiency parameter. Since we have environmental factors shaping the frontier, this is called an environmental efficiency score as well sometimes. 
in this enhanced hyperbolic distance function framework. We do this for our beloved German firm since 2005, 2014, and we find this. This is one sector, um, non metallic. Ah, this is again 24, I think, 23, 20. Um, and we find the following. So this is just the average. They will, you will have lovely uh, uh, bar plots like the other ones. There's a lot of heterogeneity out there, but on average, the, the black firms, the black crosses on top are the ETS firms. And these firms have become not much, but a bit more efficient than the other ones. Which means that if under duress, under the pressure of environmental policy, firms find ways of doing things a bit better. So Michael Porter would be pleased to see this result. There is an idea that you far from losing from environmental policy, on average, the sector becomes more efficient. Granted, some of these firms might have left the industry. Some people might have lost their jobs, but it's likely that they found it in, in, a, in the competitor firm that is, is expanding. We don't know that. We know there, is result, there are results that show that there is no loss in employment in, this, in the same industries, not by us, but by other using the same data. So I'm, not too worried about that, but this tells me that the ETS, the UETS seems to be working at, pressure, at putting pressure on development of new technology or, no, or new ways of doing things on innovation broadly um, conceived. And the last thing I want to show you is if you're really keen in thinking about innovation as technical productivity, we can also do the formal uh, work that economists usually do, so we fit a production function, and then whatever is left uh, that we cannot explain the total factor of productivity, whatever maps the, the, the inputs into output uh, and whatever magnifies this map, this total factor of productivity, which is a measure of productivity, doesn't seem to have increased or decreased for sure not. That there's no negative sign with a star. And again, sector 24 shows, which is not surprising. I mean, there must be a reason why they become more profitable more efficient, they must have found a way to do the stuff that they do even at these low prices of carbon to, to benefit from this. Technology is potentially one of these things. And I'm wrapping up. What have we learned? Well, I've told you and I think that I've convinced you that the transition to net zero is important uh, and urgent and complex and that understanding moving beyond the, the standard theory, uh, theoretical understanding and looking at how the details of the design of the instruments map into outcomes for firms and how firms react differently given different combination of the design characteristics is important and is a key to improve at least the quality and the transparency of the debate. The micro data that we have used by giving us this very fine understanding of the quality of, of the behavior of the firms across many different dimensions allow us to say quite a few things. These are some of the things that we found out. The ETS probably was not stringent enough to, emis to affect significant emissions or profits. Among Japan firms, profits have not decreased they might have increased. There is no evidence that the UTS puts any German firm at a comparative disadvantage based on the markup that we found uh, on average. Participation in the UTS is linked to increase in efficiency and productivity. And finally, there is enough heterogeneity for me to be able to keep working on this stuff for at least 15 more years. Um, so that's, for me, it's, it's important because it gets me close to pension age uh, assuming that I will have a pension by then, but you know, it's important. And the punchline is that I've done this work using um, Lithuanian data, German data, I've done some other work with um, French data. The UK data are not quite as good, and I think that more funding and better data is sorely needed if we want to have this level of understanding of the design effect, the effect of the design of environmental policy instruments also within the UK. Thank you very much.
Since we're in the same family bubble, I can probably take off my mask uh, despite the two meters uh, distance. Well, thank you, Corrado, for uh, this uh, yes, inspiring lecture. Um, I have to say, when you were writing your dissertation, um, I think the subtitle there was choosing a direction. And uh, we cannot argue, you've definitely chosen a direction of uh, really persevering and questioning uh, what is out there and, and validating the claims. Uh, I think what, what we also saw is that economics is far from being a dead science. In fact, we do engage with the policy and we can inform policy and, and make it better and make it better tailored to what the needs are and, and what's more timely uh, moment to speak about environmental policy and the need for more informed policies as such. I also want to thank you for the contribution you made to the School of Economics. Um, in choosing your direction, you traveled around the world. Uh, on your work on the EU ETS, you participated in multinational consortium, which was funded by the Horizon 2020, which took you to places like China and India and Brazil, speaking about the European experience. And, and more recently, you're collaborating with colleagues from Colombia on, their, uh, on the project of um, growing Colombia more sustainable and using uh, environmental resources in, in a better way. So once again, thank you for your contribution. Um, and, and it's lovely also to see how we, the School of Economics at UEA, uh, who has a world leading reputation, behavioral economics, has somehow shifted at least the way you speak about uh, policy by emphasizing the behavioral, uh, the needs for behavioral insights, even when we speak about uh, firms which are just minded about making profits, we, we need to be um, sensitive to the fact that, well, theory may tell us that we react, that incentives have the same way of impacting on our behavior, but uh, the data tells us that when people react to these incentives, there are other more complex um, issues at stake. So, um, I would like to now give the floor to um, our participants here in the lecture theater and our participants online um, to ask uh, questions they have. Okay. And I know Rachel should be here helping us with uh, the microphone. Yes. Hi, uh, thanks Corrado for such an interesting lecture. Um, I've got two questions if that's okay. Um, one, um, I think I, I, I love the analysis from a country level, but what is the role for local authorities and regions within countries to try and uh, push this? And the second one is about the move um, for firms to report on their scope three emissions and their supply chain, and whether or not that is also something that um, the participation in this is is uh, you know is is useful because. Um, every organization wants to uh, reduce their scope three as much as possible in their supply chain. Um, so I just want to hear some thoughts on, on, on that as, as, and as consumers, what is our role as well? Thank you. Okay, so let, let me take this one and then we see if there is anything else. Can, uh, local authority level, it would be great. I think it's, it's, it's very important to be as disaggregated as possible. So obviously I've done the analysis with the data that I access to, uh, but I know that there are efforts even uh, within the UEA of people looking at measuring productivity at the local authority level in uh, the UK. It becomes very hard to do serious empirical or statistical and econometric work with that because you, you, by the nature of a local authority, you tend to have few firms. But you can do the analysis if you have the data looking at the way in which smaller businesses operate, but you need to have the data. So it's definitely very, very important to do this. And I would be game for everything, supervising dissertation on any topic, as I said. But it's, this is genuinely very, very important because you might, you also, and each local authority has its own scope three, if you wish, because there's a lot of people traveling across 
local authorities. So you, you really need not only to see, for example, proactivity, efficiency, how to design the incentives, but you might not want to have these people traveling across local authority. Working from home has been great in many ways, bad in many other ways, and trading off the benefits of reducing uh, carbon emissions by having um, cleaner ways of transportation or not traveling or um, allowing for more flex flexible ways of working while designing offices that allow interaction between people it, it's you know it's it's the holy grail for the next 10 years and i think as an economist we can as an eco as economists we can contribute some part of that analysis I think that the social psychology of that, of that is also very, very important, and we need to interact and do more work on that. But again, an appeal. If we have data and if we have a way to collect data, I think it's going to be very, very interesting to do this. Thank you. Uh, in terms of scope three, again, same question, same, same issue. There are very few firms that even bother, uh, big multinationals bother with reporting this thing. If we found a way to infer from the behavior of workers, uh, some, or for example, or of firms, something more about scope three that could be allowed, that could allow us to have a sense of the footprint of a firm, but then you would lose the differences. So it's all about the nuances come from collecting the right type of data. And I'm sure that it would be very, very interesting to have a data set that links production behavior with supply chain behavior. What we're working on actually, it's not exactly that, but also we are looking at where firms decide to locate different branches of production and what kind of, of products they prune and they introduce when under pressure uh, from environmental policy. So that is probably related. Some of the things that we cannot explain probably also come from bottlenecks availability of in the supply chain. Carbon might become soon one of these bottlenecks and uh, the cost should be very, not only carbon, but lots of other um, environmental constraints. That would be very interesting. Thank you. Uh, we have another question here. And those who have joined us online, please uh, do feel free to type your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Corrado. As you know, I'm an escaped economist myself, and I escaped into the business school where I look at some of these issues, but from the other side, from the corporate strategy side of things. And I've got to confess, we've been in this space, similar sort of time period, and I gave up on interest, being interested in the EU to ETS, ETS because it didn't seem stringent enough to affect emissions or profits, and it wasn't putting relevant firms at a competitive disadvantage, and it wasn't decreasing profits i.e. the price was too low to have any effect whatsoever. So it gave me some hope, I hope, <laughs> to see what's been happening while I've been in my current role and <laughs> not watching the EU ETS price. So I guess how stringent is stringent enough in terms of the pricing? Do you have any very contemporary uh, research to have a sense of whether this pricing, um, to what extent we can start to see that at the aggregate level? Because my suspicion is that we can see that looking at individual companies now, but I'm curious on your perspective as to whether we can see that from the aggregate uh, point of view. Top 50%. Uh, that median for Germany hovers between 80 and 100 in the individual sectors. There are some sectors that drive those results which are quite lower. Uh, so I would say that with the kind of prices that are starting to show up uh, 75, 80 in the UTS, we might be getting to a point where there is sufficient momentum to decarbonize the lower tail of the distribution to make also the very high cost firms um, think of way different ways of doing it. So that, that's my, I, but I don't have uh, a better answer than that. Again, it's been very lax until recently, so. Thank you, and we do have some questions online in the queue. Um, so, Corrado, yes, this question comes from your online audience, um, and Eduardo says, ciao, Corrado. <laughs> 
the government aims to be carbon neutral by 2050 and will ban sales of all non-electric cars by 2035. But do you think that there is or will be the infrastructure in place for such a shift? Well, I, I hope so. Uh, we are trying to buy an electric car and we cannot have a, a charging point because our house is not designed that way. So clearly there are bottlenecks. Um, by 2050, I think electric cars will be around actually much earlier than that. Electric cars are relatively easy to do. Um, subsidies, mandates, I think that that's one of the cheaper options actually. It's much more complicated to think about commercial vehicles, although we see Amazon uh, going, oh sorry, no, there's uh, free publicity for them, uh, but going around even Norwich with their electric vehicles. So it's, you know, it's, that is changing. For the more, the bigger freight is going to be a bit more complicated and more costly. And other type of transport are much more expensive to decarbonize. But yeah, so uh, 2050, I think we can reach there. Probably it's, it's even, I, I would say it's not ambitious enough, but yeah, it, it's all about giving the right signal. But also we have to understand that from my point of view, yes, driving an electric car versus driving a petrol car might have small adjustment, but there will be much bigger adjustment that we need to make or that, and what I've seen is that there is not much uh, in, the, in the public, there is not much willingness to make bigger changes. So that is much more the bottleneck to me than uh, the provision of infrastructure. Because infrastructure will follow the demand, I think. But yeah, that's, that's my own opinion based on no data, just thinking about around these issues. So. Thank you. So we did Thank some you for uh, the question. forecasting, not only predictions here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I j just do predictions. And we have one more question from the audience um, in the lecture theater. Um, down here. Thank you. Thank you, Corrado. Uh, you know, it, I was reflecting on the fact that, of course, when I was a student, there, was, there wasn't such a thing as what you're teaching right now. There was no a module in environmental economics, most certainly not in the university I studied, you know. And um, so I, um, I don't know much about this, if not through corridor conversations that we had over the years. Um, one, one question I have for you is, is perhaps more a, a theoretical level. Um, trying to understand uh, and reflect on, 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 on the data you presented. Um, is ETS the best that we can do in terms of regulation to achieve the results that we want to achieve? Um, I found that the results that you presented uh, at the end of your presentation, of course, is really exciting. Uh, but something that concerns me uh, on a previous result you presented is the fact that, of course, the size of the business affect whether the the business is going to subject to a certain sort of regulations or not. And so all of this is going to become endogenous. Businesses are going to organize themselves in a way that can perhaps elude the cost faced by imposing ETS. Um, and of course, you know, going lean now is very trendy, isn't it? You know, so um, there is going to be an eternal run to sort of changing this regulation, which correct me if I'm wrong, it doesn't seem like changing very rapidly or rapidly enough. So what are your views about this? Am I seeing it wrong? Well, I've always, I always thought that it would be easier. I mean, there is a lot of literature, theoretical literature and empirical literature on what is the best instrument, what is the best instrument. And mostly the, the, the economist in me will always tell you that let's just put a tax on it. Right, uh, and the reason why it, that, that is part of the reason, in the sense that it's much more difficult to escape a generalized tax, um, and there is always the regulator chasing innovation to elude taxes or to uh, not 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 necessarily avoiding, but you know, uh, yeah, so to, uh, doing it legally but eluding taxes. The ETS, I think, correctly done, is a good compromise because it's 
it, it was, as I said, in 2001, there was no way that the European Union would have, or the European Commission would have been able to pass a, ta a carbon tax, because taxation is one of the things that require unanimity. It was much easier to agree to go ETS and to go ETS with grandfathering. So basically, you give uh, allowances for free. If I think of where we are five years from now till now, in terms of how many times the, regulated, the European Commission themselves have tried to tweak the ETS to improve it, uh, I am comforted that there is something that starts happening. And probably it will be, if we manage to, to get to the transition, the political will has to go up a few notches. And I don't think that an ETS, an improved ETS or a carbon tax would at the end look very different. The UK ETS that is coming up has a price floor and they're thinking about re somehow man regulating already something about the max, the, 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 the price cap. So they, they have a caller. And, you know, it's, again, it's a, the, the price, um, uh, the floor of 22 uh, is, is a clear signal that it's at least as costly. And even if you have to get businesses on board by promising them something to uh, lower the max, the spikes in the, in the, in the system, there, there is already a, a political space where you can debate things. And if there is more demand from the electorate in terms of seeing more action, I trust that we can look forward to something a bit more stringent in the future. And if we don't, you know, changes will be made for us. So it's, a, it's, it's going to be very, very challenging uh, to go into a world of more than two degrees and so on and so forth. For firms, themselves to begin with. I mean, they, they, they're not going to be able to manage the risks. In, so instead of paying taxes, they will have to pay massive insurance bills. So. Okay. And this is in the strategy space that we can discuss that. <laughs> yeah. That's not the most positive of uh, <laughs> final messages we can hear, but maybe the most uh, realistic one that we need to hear. I just want to check whether there are any uh, remaining questions from our online guests, um, and I see a no. And therefore, I would like to, to thank uh, you uh, for being here tonight, as well as thank our online participants uh, for tuning in and uh, for their questions, and uh, to wish them a very pleasant evening, and to invite uh, you, those who are with us in the lecture theater, uh, for, a, for a, a drink and um, a snack uh, at the end. Thank you very much. Thank you.